The social history and the relevance of Pullman is so significant on a national basis. Uh, there's a man I'm going to uh, introduce in a moment who uh, calls me about every week to talk about what we should be doing about Pullman uh, and uh, for a good reason. Uh, I want to say that it is possible that we will see some kind of legislation introduced in the very near future. Both Mark Kirk and Senator Durbin, both senators are supporting it. Uh, and uh, whether or not it becomes a national park or national historic park, it's something that will be, uh, if we are part of that process, then that story can be interpreted, not like the Museum of Science and Industry about industry, but about workers and about the relationship that workers have to creating America. It's the story of immigration. It's the story of labor. It's the story of our class struggle. It's the story of every aspect of American history right here in Chicago and if we don't capture we don't interpret it then somebody else is going to write that history in a way that will not be correct we know what it is and that's why we need to support this so keep up on our website and uh, uh, I will let Larry know that uh, we're working together in partnership the Illinois AFL-CIO the National AFL-CIO the Chicago Federation of Labor who are here today are all supporting this campaign along with many other organizations organizations. I want to talk about our organization, the Illinois Labor History Society. What does that mean? It means that in 1889, after the death, after the murder, the judicial murder of the Haymarket Martyrs, workers met in Paris, France, and they said, because of the Haymarket Martyrs, we're going to celebrate International Labor Day. We are going to have Workers of the world unite around this issue that May 1st should be remembered for the martyrs of Chicago in 1890, which will be 125th anniversary this 2014. Because of the events in Chicago, you're not going to be a member of that organization. We hope the French will be there and the Germans will be there this year. It's 125th anniversary to dedicate plaques like the New Zealanders and like the Japanese and the Mexicans and the Colombians. How come they could come to America to celebrate Labor Day and we don't even know what it is? That's Labor Day and that's why the immigrants around this country have been marching on May 1st. Because it's our holiday. Because we created the wealth and because people who are here today this legacy of the Pioneer and Aid Support Association of Lucy Parsons, one of the greatest women of all time that nobody knows unless you read one of our books or you paid attention one day in college. This legacy was carried on in 1969 because a man with a vision who is here, who was born before, the Bread and Roses strike of 1912. Les O'Rear, a founder along with Studs Terkel and many others, Bill Edelman. Les O'Rear. calls me all the time to tell me what we should be doing, and he's always right. It's a difference between him and me. I'm wrong half the time. But anyway, this idea of honoring the Haymarket and honoring Emma Goldman and people who are here tonight who are part of that legacy, who are going to honor, it is something that allows us to cherish a past and to think about how we should do things differently in the future. Lord knows we're all insane if we just repeat the same thing over and over again. You know that cliche. We're not gonna, we can't do that. And we're learning that in this modern labor movement that we're made, we, we can't do the same things over and over again. So I hope you will fill it out. You will join because that's why we, and how we keep going, uh, your unions, you're in as individuals. I don't think you have a choice in the matter if you really, to your heart, believe in this idea that history matters. Enough said. I'm going to be bringing up a couple people in a moment. The first person that I'd like to come up is our host 
of the National Association of Letter Carriers and therefore our host. Mac Julian, who has become a person who has strongly real, if he didn't realize it before, and I know he did because I look in his office and I see the various posters of people of very important, uh, uh, of our importance in history and labor history. Mac Julian is president of Branch 11 here. Uh, he and the National Association of Letter Carriers have been very, very gracious in helping us work out details of having this hall. And of course, you know the letter carriers have been struggling like every public employee in this country because the race to the bottom has gone from the 6% left in the private sector I represented to the 50% of the labor movement that is now public sector and Mac Julian, I would uh, again ask you to come forth and say a few words. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. How are we doing? <laughs> Food was good, right? Uh, I just want to take this opportunity to uh, welcome you all to the James E. Worsham Building. Uh, this is the home of letter carriers, the National Association of Letter Carriers, local branch number 11, Chicago. Uh, you know, I was thinking as I was sitting there and Larry was talking about the weather, you, you really got to be pretty committed, enthused, advocates for labor to come out on a night like tonight and fill up this room. Larry was talking earlier about how few people that he expected to be here. Uh, but, you know, like I said, you have to be some true advocates or, or just a letter carrier. For us, this is just like a regular day in the office. <laughs> I um, want to share with you what I, what I told Larry when he asked. This is our, I believe, our third time hosting. Um, and um, I told him it is, it's truly an honor uh, to play host. Uh, to labor. We like to thank uh, our house as we uh, tell our fellow letter carriers. We have branch 825 in the house. Letter carriers wave. All right. <clears throat> That ours is not just a home for, you know, Chicago letter carriers, but for all letter carriers tonight, you know, we play uh, the home for all, all of labor in Illinois. So it is truly an honor to host. Uh, you know, the, the saying that uh, injury to one is an injury to all. Uh, well, when there's a victory for one, there's a victory for all, right? When there's advances in the labor movement, it is advances uh, for all uh, in the labor movement. So uh, with that, on behalf of the uh, letter carriers in Chicago and the State Association, I just want to uh, salute those uh, who are being honored tonight, uh, who for whatever uh, they've done has made it better for all in the labor movement. So uh, for that, it, it, is, it is really an honor uh, to be a host, and I salute those who we honor tonight. You know, whether we're fighting uh, for 15, whether it's the fight for 15 or, or our struggle to maintain uh, six-day delivery for letter carriers, uh, we are all uh, in this together. Uh, so with that said, uh, again, I hope you all enjoy your evening. Uh, welcome to the home of letter carriers tonight, the home of labor. God bless you all. Thank you. Let's thank Mac Julian again. He's been a good leader for uh, his membership and the labor movement. Before I uh, introduce uh, our next uh, greeter, uh, it's not like a Walmart greeter, Tim. I'm, uh, it's a little more. But I know that uh, many of you have either a heavy heart or maybe delighted because when our heroes pass away, we tend be, to be sad, but then we think about what it really means, which is why whenever I do a tour at the cemetery, I tell people, these people want you to dance on their graves. Emma Goldman said she doesn't want to be a party revolution if she can't dance, so let's dance. But before we do that, I do want to recognize uh, our friend of the labor movement who spent 27 years in prison, Nelson Mandela, who played a prominent role when he came. <laughs> 
one thing about being an AFSCME, and I know I have a lot of brothers and sisters here, when our uh, good friend, uh, Associate Director Rose Daly, was the keynote when Nelson Mandela was here in 1993, and uh, Kosatu has written to us now twice and said they want to dedicate a plaque at the Haymarket, but it's just been difficult, and in the next year or two, I think we're going to see that, uh, because, again, somebody like Les O'Rear has helped bring to the front uh, the idea, along with others, that we have to remember this. So um, a good friend of mine is here. Uh, I consider him to be somebody with incredible integrity because he's true and authentic about what he believes and what, how he acts. His name is Tim Yeager, Father Tim Yeager, who was recently ordained as an Episcopalian minister. And Tim, would you come up here just for a moment and just help us think in whatever terms as it is uh, spoken through you something about our friend Nelson Mandela. By the way, Tim for, spent a lifetime representing auto workers in the uh, public and not-for-profit sector, and uh, well, he has a special person in his life who knows a lot about the Lyric Opera. <laughs> That would be my wife, Caroline Moores, who is also a member of the American Guild of Musical Artists, AFL-CIO, here with me tonight. Well, we knew it was going to happen. We knew he'd been sick. And we'd seen him go to the hospital, and we'd seen his family gather around. And yet, when the news came on Thursday, that Nelson Mandela had ended his earthly journey with us, there were not a few of us that were in tears. It's rare in our lifetime do we see a giant of such integrity and dedication to the cause of justice walk among us and then to have the moment come when he has left us. There are people that are mourning, of course, and we will mourn the gaping hole that he leaves in our consciousness. But more than anything, I think the appropriate emotion would be gratitude. Gratitude for the years that Nelson Mandela gave us. Gratitude for the way in which he lived his life. You see, when they crucified Jesus back around 33 AD, scared off his followers, the Roman Empire thought, well, takes care of that. Won't have to deal with these pesky Jewish radicals disturbing the empire, but how wrong they were. And when the racist ruling thugs of the South African regime sentenced our brother Nelson Mandela to life imprisonment in 1964, along with many of his comrades in the ANC and the South African Communist Party and Kosatu, you can just imagine that in Pretoria there were smug little toasts and people spanking their hands and saying, well, that took care of that, and how wrong they were. You see, the thing that we should take away from Nelson Mandela is, the thing we should learn from him is to live without fear to live with integrity. Do not put a price tag on standing for the truth. You know, they tried to get him out of prison. They tried to get him to agree to some sort of plea agreement by which he'd be released early. He'd go back to his family. All he had to do was renounce all his friends and his comrades in the struggle that he'd been fighting with. They were picking on the wrong man when they tried to tell Nelson Mandela to do anything that he felt was not right. And so, I 
at St. Andrew's Episcopal Church today, we told our children there is no better model for you to look to to live your life than to study the life of Nelson Mandela. And we lit candles and we said prayers and, and we honored his memory. Tonight here, we come from many different traditions, many faiths, many different philosophies. I'm going to ask you to do two things to show our solidarity with our fallen brother. First of all, I want you to stand and observe a minute of silence with me. And then when that is concluded, I want you to raise your fist high in the air and shout as loud as you can the word Amandla, which is the Zulu word for power, power to the people. Let us resolve here tonight to live without fear as our brother Nelson did. A moment of silence now, please. Amandla. Amandla. Thank you. Some of you know that uh, I have this passion for the Illinois Labor History Society for the same reasons that most of you came here tonight and understand the relationships of why we want to tell the workers' story. A uh, person that has never failed to say, what can I do to help, is here. And uh, he has two children with him, Lily and Jack, so he has to be mindful of his time. And uh, I just think it's another example of dedication when somebody has their two kids and they're out driving around in the snow and trying to entertain them and I know it's an exciting moment for children to be here <laughs> but uh, to do that but Tim Dre who is the secretary treasurer of the Illinois AFL-CIO who has taken a great deal of pride in helping us has a few words uh, and um, I just always appreciate that Tim's willing to come no matter when and where it is thank you Tim thank you thank you Oh, good evening. Good evening. Um, you know, this is kind of like a welcome, and it doesn't say so on the program, but it's going to be a goodbye, too. I, I really do have to get, I mean, we, we drove up this morning and kind of hung out around Chicago a little bit, but we have to get right back tonight. Got to get them to school tomorrow. My plan was to have these two kids learn a little bit of labor history and then go back on the playground tomorrow and do a little bit of organizing and longer lunch hour, you know, shorter school day, get going, solidarity, but we got to go. I mean, I got to get them, I got to get them home or, you you know, mom's going to come looking for me. Um, anyway, I, you know, I want to I want to start by saying Mike Kerrigan, uh, president of the AFL-CIO, went into the IBW in 1977. And I, I came out of the Marine Corps in 1979, went right into the UMWA, United Mine Workers. And uh, of course, uh, and I, I have to appreciate and thank people like uh, Mr. O'Rear that started it and then trailblazed for me because joining being in a union in 1979 was much 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 different than it was today i mean when contracts came along and things like that um i, I have to say that uh you know our contracts used to the companies used to respect uh things like family values and double time on sundays and, and things like that and where they you know now they just you sit down and they want re regressionary bargaining and so that's why you know when i hear the our walmart people and the fight for 15 and stuff and it's like there is a new beginning in labor and, and we are fighting for the rights of today's low wage and immigrant workers and we're going to keep that and their fight is going to be their fight down here and when they enter the, the workplace workplace i would hope that that it'll be much much like it was when I entered and, and my fathers and, and everything had, had done for us 
And so it's it's a pleasure being here. Um, Esther, I, I hate Mark, congratulations. Esther, I'm gonna miss your, your speech. I mean, I know that's always it's always great. Uh, but I do have to, to take off and um, anyway, God, God love you and uh, among love. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Mark Rogovin is a very important person for many reasons. Now, I'm not going to, I didn't even prepare anything, Mark, because I figured you would say, talk about yourself as an artist. You're able to do that. P, are, you know artists. But seriously, Mark, who we're inducting for reasons that some of you may not know, has been in so many ways our protector of the hay market. Mark was the author, the editor of the first Day Will Come book, and you've seen the new book when we did the 2011 restoration of the monument. Mark is the one that did the primary research to find all these people around the country that have come to the hay market. Mark, how many are there now that we have in the book? 140, although in the book it doesn't have that many. He keeps finding things. I don't know how he does it. He'll probably want to come up here and talk about his uh, great dad's art, but I'm going to stop now because Mark, he's already getting up here and uh, he's going to talk about himself. But Mark, I want you to know, will be remembered in the consciousness of people that know the hay market because he is our preservationist. He is our citizen activist, and I'm honored to ask Mark Govin to say whatever he wants to say, and then we'll move on. Thanks. This is really a, it's wonderful to be at this center and to be with so many friends and folks who, who I don't know. It's wonderful. Well, just briefly, before I get into my 16 pages of notes, <laughs> I want to say that just in communication with a small number of people, what I'm going to be talking about tonight, about the, the cemetery in Forest Park where the Haymarket martyrs are, are buried, that many of you have never been to the cemetery. Could I get a show of hands of people who have never been to that cemetery? Very good, very good. Well, I, I am going to give out Larry's home phone number. <laughs> and you should, you, should, you should call after midnight and set up any dates that you would like to, to get a tour of the cemetery. <laughs> um, when you honor me, you honor a community of people. What I do in relation to Forest Home Cemetery is inspired by the amazing and rich history that happens to be just one block from my home. I gave a tour of the gravestones in the area of the martyrs, and I came to the cemetery when the gates were open, and I swept the newly fallen snow off of Lucy's grave and from 20 others. But there are so many people that I have worked in concert with, including Larry, my wife Michelle, uh, Joe Powers, Estelle Carroll, and many more. And there is a librarian in the room tonight uh, who I gave some tough work to track down, and she wants more. Um, the last 20 years of reach research has come uh, with the help from the cemetery manager and staff, the head groundskeeper from the local press and the Forest Park Historical Society. It has been a thrill to join in the preservation and promotion of labor's history. In graveyards, this is really a serious issue. In graveyards across the U.S., there is rampant theft 
of bronze plaques from gravestones and monuments. Many of you know this. People come in and pry off bronze items and bring them to junkyards looking for cash. Early in the 1980s, the bronze laurel wreath from the base of the Martyrs Monument was stolen on the 125th anniversary of Haymarket with a huge crowd that missing sculpture was replaced at the cost of $50,000 raised by the Illinois Labor History Society. That piece was created and installed. A rubber mold was created for $6,000 in case of theft again. We are developing plans to create molds of the incredible uh, plaque by Governor Peter Altgelt on the back side of the Martyrs Monument and the nearby bronze portrait of Emma Goldman. We will need to come to you to raise financial help to aid in this campaign. There is so much research yet to be done. On Friday, I went to the cemetery to scope out four gravestones, all with the surname of one of the martyrs. The gravestones were about 30 feet from the martyr's monument. It could not be, you know, it cannot be a coincidence, or it is a quint, whatever it is. We have discovered the location of the burial for the daughter of Lucy and Albert Parsons, as well as the widow of August Spees, Nina Van Zant Spees, and lots more. Our, in quote, new grave, uh, or one new grave was restored by a professional from the Association for Gravestone Studies. On the cemetery, on the other side of the Des Plaines River, there is a monument for the Cigar Makers International Local Number 14, the 9 by 32 inch bronze plaque was stolen probably in the 80s. If anyone has a good quality photograph of that plaque, I have an award to that person, um, a real for real Cuban cigar. <laughs> Once we find a good photo, we will figure out a campaign to create the plaque. It would be great to have all the gravestones and monuments for progressives in safe and excellent condition. Bring your families, neighbors, visiting friends, fellow trade unionists, and classrooms to learn some rich and amazing history. Besides Radical Row, there are unique burials of Roma, gypsies, and further into the cemetery, there is a Druid burial site. Um, and Tiffany designed monuments, and two for Native Americans whose land was confiscated. I am delighted to receive this honor. With the help of the Illinois Labor History Society, we will continue to work with others to preserve the Martyrs Monument and make discoveries. We will keep Radical Row a rich resource for labor's history. Thank you very much. So Mark, I know you like art on your walls but I hope you'll put this up. And this is our little piece that, oh, for the photographers. Here, you, you, you hold it. 
It says something about how he's a great guy and is our citizen historian on this day, December 8th. You are forever Thanks. a member of the Illinois Labor History Society, right. inducted in our Union Hall of Honor. Beautiful. Mark Rogovin, thank you. I hope you read the piece about Mark that's in the book. It's, uh, uh, he deserves a lot more space than that, but you go to uh, his uh, uh, website, you'll see all the things that he does. Uh, founder of the Peace Museum, preserving his father's great art and uh, photography and beyond. The uh, um, next part of the program, I want to bring up a friend of mine also. He is the Secretary Treasurer of the Chicago Federation of Labor, an organization that also has been, continues to help us figure out how we're going to tell the workers' story. There are so many things that the CFL has to do on a day-to-day -day basis, and the fact that Bob was able uh, uh, to come here, uh, Jorge is traveling, uh, Jorge Ramirez, uh, Bob's been willing to, uh, you've seen Bob at our May Day rallies, uh, Bob is vociferously part of that thing in organized labor that says we must reclaim our history, we must reclaim May Day, we should be proud of it. And this is a new idea for some of us over the last 20 or 25 years that have been in the labor movement. And I'm proud that Bob Ryder is willing to uh, push those issues to, and there's so much more that Bob comes up with ideas about history that uh, it's just great that the leadership of the Chicago Federation of Labor is in support of these issues. Bob has a few things to say, and he is a special person to introduce, and I want to thank Bob for being here. And before, before I get started with what I have here, um, this is going to sound like a commercial, but I'm going to jump right into it. Mike Matika from the Laborers Union has been working on one of our other Union Hall of Honor events that's going to take place down in Southern Illinois, and it's going to um, honor and induct Connell Smith, who many of you may not know, but you may know his son, his son's Ed Smith, who was um, also from the Laborers Union, uh, international vice president with the Laborers, um, retired a few years back, and now runs Ulico, which is a union um, company. But the, I, me I mentioned, I mentioned um, Ed, he was a great labor leader. His father was a great labor leader, um, did a lot of uh, amazing things, both of them, for the Laborers Union. Something that also ties into um, Connell and Ed Smith on the Ulico connection is um, before I get to my introduction of Esther, we have another former director of the Illinois Department of Labor here tonight, a good friend. He was a good friend of ours um, when he served. He's a former business manager of uh, electricians, uh, IBW Local 701. Um, he's sitting in the back of the room, so Art, stand up. Art Ludwig. We've been real lucky here the last number of years. We've had some great folks in that um, position. And uh, as Larry said, my name is Bob Ryder, and I'm Secretary Treasurer of the Chicago Federation of Labor. On behalf of myself and CFL President Jorge Ramirez, I want to welcome you to the hometown of the American Labor Movement, Chicago, Illinois. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> It's no surprise to us that this city and this state continue to lead nationally in union density, activity, and solidarity. We have such a rich history and tradition that stems back to our forefathers who fought, fought and gave their blood for rights like the eight-hour workday. And tonight, this is an important program. Labor history is just one moment past. Everything we, what we did yesterday, yesterday is labor history. Fighting for low wage and immigrant workers in this history, is that, that's history that we should make every day. We have folks I know here from the Fight for 15. We have people that are out there either part of or supporting the our Walmart movement. That's where the labor movement needs to be. The labor movement needs to be in these low wage worker campaigns, right? <laughs> Our
I was going to say a bunch of nice things about Tim Dre. He's a great guy, good friend of mine, the state, Illinois AFL-CIO. Um, great folks, but he left so I can cut that down in half now. No. <laughs> um, and Tim, Tim, Tim has experience, though, in the low-age worker movement. Before he went to the Illinois AFL-CIO, uh, he worked at UFCW Local 881, um, representing uh, folks, among other things, working grocery stores and uh, a lot of uh, immigrant, um, immigrant workers. Now on to another activist from the UFCW. Like my partner, Jorge Ramirez, Esther Lopez is a member of UFCW Local 1546. Now an international vice president with the UFCW, Esther continues to fight for working men and women on several fronts. From legislation and politics to worker and community organizing, her experience in the labor movement is extensive and diverse. Prior to becoming director of the UFCW Civil Rights and Community Action Department in November 2006, Esther played an active role in improving labor conditions in the state of Illinois, serving as deputy chief of staff for labor under the governor, as well as um, director of the Illinois Department of Labor. She served as the principal liaison to Illinois unions while also overseeing labor policies and other um, uh, relations affecting private and public employees. Esther formally supervised the Illinois Office of New American Immigrant Policy and Advocacy. In that capacity, she developed community outreach strategies and managed the agency's monitoring of national immigration reform and development of policies and strategies to facilitate, to facilitate the integration of new immigrants to their communities. She was on the national staff of the FLCIO, where she served as assistant director in the field mobilization department. She cultivated meaningful relationships among unions, state federations, and labor councils and directed a national network of nearly 400 community service liaisons across the country in an effort to promote immigrant worker rights and community services. My career as an activist in the labor movement began when Esther was a director at IDOL. I can think of no one more appropriate to be here tonight to talk about the low wage worker struggle, to talk about Im uh, issues affecting immigrant workers than our very own Esther Lopez. What a great, uh, what a great night for me. I, I can't uh, tell you how special it is. I, I live in Chicago, but I don't get to Chicago a lot. I, I travel a lot, um, and I get to um, spend a lot of time in places like Dodge City, Kansas, and Tar Heel, North Carolina. So it's always wonderful to come home to what I know to be the best labor movement in the country. It is great to be home in Chicago. I, um, I was so moved by the word gratitude for Nelson Mandela. I, what an important moment to think about the power of history for, let me just say one sentence, I am so grateful to the people of South Africa and for Nelson Mandela for defeating the most brutal and the most oppressive system of my time, apartheid. I am grateful for that. Thank you, Larry. Thank you to the board, the Illinois Labor History Society, for asking the UFCW to be part of today's program. On behalf of President Hansen and 1.3 million members of our union, we'd like to say congratulations to Mark and thank you for your work in preserving the people's history. Members are men and women that get up every day to put food on America's table. 
you will see our members uh, in case in case you hadn't thought about it lately bacon doesn't come wrapped in those nice little packages that you pick up at the store there are pigs that become bacon and those are our members sisters and brothers the hardest working uh, hardest working and and men and women that build our country meal by meal. I am especially thrilled to be here tonight to witness the induction of Refugio Martinez to the Labor Hall of Honor. And I am thrilled to be in the presence of Les Orier. You see, there was a time, and he probably doesn't remember, when a Mexican school teacher who was working at the Chicago Metro History Center wrote a curriculum about the life of Refugio Martinez. The curriculum is entitled Learning History Through Biography. And I must have spent many hours with Mr. O'Rear going through his documents. And one of the lessons in this curriculum is uh, oral histories, of which one of the oral histories is Mr. O'Rear talking about Refugio Martinez. So you can see why I am just thrilled to be here tonight. It's just a full circle coming together. You see, it's got to be the Illinois Labor History Society that would recognize and honor the life of a meatpacking worker, of an organizer, of a man who stood between his community and what was then the Depression. And only the Labor Society would recognize and honor the value of that one organizer, one meatpacking organizer. My current position in the UFCW makes me reflect deeply on the life of Refugio Martinez. You see, our members, particularly in the packing industry, but not only, very much so on the retail side of our members, of our, mem of our union, are immigrants. And George W. Bush, for some reason, decided that, that he was going to target meatpacking workers and build the most, the largest, the most expensive enforcement apparatus around immigration violations that we've ever seen in this country. In fact, sisters and brothers, the immigration apparatus, the incarceration and detention of immigrant workers in this country, the budget for ICE now far exceeds the budget of the FBI, the NSA, the, the DEA, and the US Marshals combined. Combined. So what we are witnessing today, what we are witnessing today is that I am sorry to report that the Obama administration will soon reach the tragic milestone of deporting nearly two million people since he became president. For those of you historians, I ask you to think of another point in history 
where there has been such a massive forced repatri repatriation of a people. That is the value of understanding history, of recognizing, and that is the lessons that I've learned from an organizer named Refugio Martinez. You see, how the labor, how the American labor movement stands on this issue of immigrant workers will define us as a movement. It will be, it will be the point, the judgment of whether we do in fact stand for all workers. I was just at a organizing campaign in Maryland and Virginia on Thursday last week with about 50 immigrant workers who work at a thrift store. You know, you guys all seen this, you know, these little thrift stores that look like they're a bunch of independents? Well, they're not. They're huge, huge companies that span states. This one in particular, Savers, it has stores in about 14 states across the country. And you, and you, and you go there and you think, oh, I'm doing a good thing. I'm donating my, my used goods to this, to this thrift store. And somebody's making a tremendous amount of profit because of the generosity of our communities. What's worse is somebody is seriously and horribly oppressing immigrant workers. Never paying overtime. All the standards that we believe as a labor movement, we are not asking for anything, anything out of the ordinary, and let me just say this about the low-wage worker issue. My God, you think that it, because we're asking for 10 or $15 an hour, you think that we were asking for the moon. You would think how dare workers think they deserve to be paid for overtime. It's almost like, what has happened? Where have we gone so wrong as a nation, as a country, that out of a sudden, there's such high tolerance for such high levels of poverty? This, sisters and brothers, is why we are so grateful to the courage of low wage workers, of workers that are making seven and eight and nine dollars an hour, who have the courage to stand up to the Walmart, the giant, the greediest of all greeds. You see, you want to corporate greed, you want to define exploitation, you want to define what is wrong with our economy, it's called Walmart. Yes. It's called Walmart. Is that my timekeeper? I actually have a timekeeper. Did you see that? That was pretty good, huh? I got, I, I got a shout out to my sisters and brothers from my local, my home local here in local 1546, who rang the bell. I asked them to be discreet. <laughs> I think that means my time is up. <laughs> I just want to say, 
What a defining moment for us. Where do you stand? Where do we stand? How, where is the threshold of injustice here? How can we sit and, and be so tolerant of these immigration enforcement policies from our own, let's face it, sisters and brothers, we cannot excuse it. I am not, you, this is not Esther's opinion, this is a fact. The Obama administration has now deported more people. We have to, we have to call it. We can't pretend like it's not happening because there are communities and families and workers who are being brutalized by that enforcement apparatus. Just like millions of young Latino and African American males are being incarcerated every day. Yes. We cannot stand idly by and say that we can pretend. We cannot watch women. As a, there's a, the saddest article I've read in the longest time in the American Prospect who said, you know who, what group of people is dying at an earlier age in this country? Poor white women. This is not to be tolerated. The, cup of endureth, endurance runneth over. Let me close by saying this. I was at a celebration in Washington, D.C., where some incredible immigrant leaders are fasting for families. They have been fasting for almost a month now calling on the Obama administration to stop separating, disuniting families. There are incredible efforts in this country to raise the minimum wage. There are incredible struggles by workers. <coughs> and for us in the labor movement, we have to now, this is, this is no more weedy weedy. We gotta put some skin on the game, sisters and brothers. We gotta go out and get arrested with some of these workers. We gotta fast with some of these workers. We gotta fight with some of these workers. The time for talk is over. And history has shown us those moments where action is the only way to go. Where skin in the game is the only way to go. Sisters and brothers, blessed are those who starve for justice, for they shall be satisfied. Thank you, thank you for having me tonight. Thank you. Sister Esther Lopez, everybody, let's thank her again for coming from Washington to be with us. Sister Lopez is going to stay up here for a moment. We, uh, I beg your indulgence for a couple more minutes. Is Emily, Emily uh, Popobita, are you here? Come on up. Emily is the person, is the woman who wrote the piece on Refugio that's in the book that I hope that you'll read about. There is also a student performance that's on YouTube, but was done a few years ago about the trial that uh, we will probably try to link to our website shortly. But uh, Emily has a uh, couple 
a couple of words to say, and then uh, uh, Sister Lopez will receive the uh, will induction into the Union Hall of Honor for Refugio. Hi. So, Esther Lopez has just talked to us beautifully about the legacy of Refugio Martinez, and so I'll just say a few quick words about what it means to, to be honoring somebody like this. As somebody who plans to spend my life teaching labor and immigration history, and somebody who specifically studies deportation, it's incredibly meaningful to me to be able to present an honor to somebody who literally put his own life and his family on the line to stand up for what he believed was right for himself and his community. Refugio Martinez was a Mexican-born activist who lived in Chicago for almost three decades, working for the United Packing House Workers and advocating for the unemployed, immigrants, Mexican-Americans, and workers throughout the city. Deported for his valiant stance, Martinez exemplifies the bravery of labor activists willing to take a great personal risk to stand up for their communities, their values, and their fellow workers. He understood that workers' rights require more than just workplace actions. They require community involvement, struggles for dignity and respect, and defense of immigrants and workers of color. Justice immigrant union leaders today are a critical force in the labor movement. Martinez and his fellow UPWA activists were important in the fight for better conditions for immigrants and laboring people throughout the 1930s and 1940s. As we look today to the intersection of labor struggles and immigrant rights in our current political landscape, we can proudly remember the brave activism of Refugio Martinez, a labor and community leader who devoted his life to improving conditions for working people, both native-born and foreign-born. And I want to thank today's advocates who bring together these struggles for immigrant and labor rights. And um, so I'm, I'm honored to be able to present this award on behalf of such a bold struggler for all of the issues that, that are connected in today's landscape. Thank you. One more piece of our official business. Uh, by the way, the, I, history is so full of irony and coincidences, and there's a person here today who is sitting next to Les O'Rear, Reva Richards. She is the granddaughter of Les O'Rear and happens to be friends with or was friends with and is the granddaughter of Refugio. Oh because Refugio's children lived with the O'Rears for a while during that period of that struggle. And uh, it is just so interesting and so amazing that uh, Alexandria Kondraki, who uh, is uh, the granddaughter, uh, is friends with Les O'Rears' granddaughter. Reva, would you just wave, say hello? Before I, uh, uh, we honor those who are fighting today, uh, I'd just ask that anybody that's here that is uh, an officer or on the board of the Illinois Labor History Society to please stand so that people see you on the street, they'll know who they're dealing with. <laughs> they're all over the room. I also want to mention that Emily is the daughter of one of our, of our recording secretary, Debbie Pope, who is uh, with the Chicago Teachers Union. The, finally, we have people with courage all the time that are willing to do things to act in ways that most people won't. You know, it was Lucy Parsons who said that it is a crime to be passive when slavery is stealing over us. It's a crime. I believe that. I can't do everything, but can't we do something individually? Of course we can. And there are people here today, and I'm going to ask workers from three campaigns to come up right now, 
our Walmart, Warehouse Workers for Justice, and the Fight for 15, and Sister Lopez is going to offer a plaque to each of those groups. Will you all come up, please, all of you? of the plaque. We salute low-wage workers standing up to win dignity and respect on the job, a fair living wage, and a right to form a union. Your struggles are transforming the labor movement and renewing our historic mission. A special recognition and our pledge of solidarity to our Walmart. <laughs> On behalf of our Walmart, I'd like to thank everyone in this room. We really are honored and appreciate your support on our fight with Walmart. And it's an ongoing battle, and I hope I'd be happy to see each and every one of you stand up with us going forward in the future. Uh, we take civil disobedience, we take on all uh, protests and whatever we can do to change the direction that Walmart is taking this country and give it back to the people of the United States of America. Thank you. Special recognition and our pledge of solidarity to the warehouse workers for justice. Yeah. On behalf of the Warehouse Workers for Justice, I just want to say thank you and for everyone who's behind us on this. You know, we're a small voice still, but you know, with your support, we'll, we'll, we'll get this movement going like it should. Yes. I don't know about you, but I don't see no small voices in the Warehouse Workers, huh? <laughs> And finally, our pledge of special recognition and pledge of solidarity to the Chicago Fight for 50. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Matthew. I'm a worker at Whole Foods. I'm a member of the uh, Workers' Organizing Committee uh, of Chicago. Um, uh, a campaign that's fighting for $15 an hour and decency and respect on the job. Uh, thank you uh, to the Illinois Labor History Society. Um, you know, being here um, in such good company and with such good uh, food, I'm reminded of an anecdote from uh, Big Bill Haywood, the IWW organizer. Uh, when he was criticized for smoking an exquisite cigar one evening, he leaned in with his one good eye and he said, nothing is too good for the working class. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I think that that lesson applies so dearly to us who are gathered here this evening. When they say $15 is, an, is too good for us, we say there's nothing too good for the working class. Uh, thank you again to the Illinois Labor History Society. Uh, thank you again to the organizations that have supported us uh, in our activities and our strikes uh, on the picket lines. And thank you for, to, to all of you who have come here together tonight to honor us. Solidarity forever. Thank you very much. So you don't leave yet. You can't. You have two things you have to do in addition to recognizing what the 
courage that these folks are expressing every single day. As we know, when you organize a union, since it's illegal to organize in the United States with the, le the worst labor laws in the developed world, you're going to get fired unless you have good company and your concerted activity. That's right. Your neighbors don't know this. And that's why you got to go out and talk about America's law has to change. And it's not going to change by just talking to some politicians. It's going to change from sitting in that plant, taking over the factory, marching in the streets, going on strike, and all those things that we've done in the past. So I close on those words of action, which also includes you joining the Illinois Labor History Society. And I want to also thank that young woman, Joanna Misnick, in the back. She probably won't raise her hand. She's in the back, who put the book together, who sent out the mailing, who makes this happen, Joanna Misnick, finally. I want to thank all our folks who came to say a few words, and especially Sister Lopez for coming this far and knowing that the connection to our honoree, Mr. Martinez, is long and deep. So I want to thank all of you for being here again, as you do every year. And I'd like to ask our, uh, hey, by the way, 2015 is the execution. Do I see, we like this kind of stuff. The execution, 100th anniversary of Joe Hill. Where was his funeral? Where are his first ashes? At the Haymarket, his funeral in Chicago. 2015, we're going to have a blowout for Joe Hill. IWW, <laughs> our history. Will our Joe Hill come on up, Bucky, and sing us some of our, our, our favorite national uh, anthem of the labor movement? Will everybody stand up? Will everybody join hands? And remember that we came here today in solidarity and celebration and that we have each other. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. When the union's inspiration through the workers' blood shall run, there will be no greater, greater anywhere beneath the sun. If what force on earth is weaker than the feeble strength of one? Oh, the union makes us strong. Here we go now. Solidarity forever. Solidarity. Untold millions that they never toiled to earn, but without our brains and muscle, not a single wheel would turn. We can break their haughty power, gain our freedom when we learn that the union makes us strong. Or now, solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. is placed the power greater than their hoarded gold greater than the strength of armies magnified a thousand toll we can bring to earth the new world on the ashes of the old when the union makes us strong Here we go. solidarity forever solidarity forever solidarity forever for the union makes us strong one more chorus now solidarity forever solidarity forever solidarity forever for the union makes us strong all right thank you